Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome. My name's Mark Malcolmson. Uh, I'm the principal of City Lit, and I'd like to welcome you to day one of this year's Mental Wealth Festival. Um, there's already been a whole series of events during um, the last few days, uh, sorry, the last few hours. And um, one of the highlights is this evening's um, cookery extravaganza and, and educational extravaganza at the same time. Um, obviously, this year has been different. This is our sixth mental wealth festival. The first five were all in person. They were based in the college, at the National Gallery, the British Museum, all around London. Uh, this year, we've gone online and um, that's created a whole series of different challenges. But actually, we'd like to, in the spirit of the Mental Wealth Festival, talk about the the opportunities it's created. And the opportunities it's created is, has meant that we've able to, been able to reach far beyond our usual audience of people who can kind of get easily into the center of London. So that's been good and we've got people registered for across Britain and from actually outside Britain. But the other advantage has been is we've had some amazing speakers and amazing guests over the last five years, but this time we've gone truly international. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a very brief story about how this particular session came about. So back in January, um, I was at a meeting in California and at, over breakfast, I got chatting to this lovely lady I'd never met before. And um, we were talking about what each other did. And she explained that she was a medical for professional and she concentrated in diet, but also the, the well-being aspects of diet and the mental health aspects of diet. And I kind of explained that I was principal of City Lit and what City Lit was, and that we had this mental wealth festival and how wouldn't it be marvelous if she'd be able to attend? But obviously she's based in Boston and probably wouldn't actually happen, but it'd be a lovely idea. Um, fast forward to the spring, um, as you all know, we all in both countries had a very difficult spring um, and uh, we were thinking about what to do with the festival this year and one of the things we decided to do was obviously take the festival online. So in the process of doing that, we thought, well, what are the opportunities as well as what are the problems? And I remembered the wonderful lady from California. Um, and I thought, actually, let's let's really take, take the ball and run with it. So I contacted Uma and said, isn't your book coming out in September in Britain? She said, yes, it is. I said, would you like to reach a British audience? You might not be able to travel over to Britain at that point, but we've got an opportunity to bring some um, intelligent, erudite people together to um, hear about what you've got to do. She said yes. Um, she also took our boundaries out quite dramatically because she said, well, I don't want to just talk about it. I actually want to cook and um, I want to actually explain what I do and I, I want to see it in action. And then people at the end of the session can have dinner. Um, and I thought, wow, that's brilliant. And I talked to our, our kind of technical team and they said, well, yeah, why not? Um, and here we are in Britain on a Monday night, in Boston on a Monday lunchtime. So Uma's gonna have a lunch prepared by the end of this. And hopefully all of you, if you've got your cauliflowers on hand, are gonna have your dinner ready at the end of this session. So not only is it education, it's, it's food. What a perfect combination. So what I'm gonna do is hand over to Uma in Boston. Um, we've got the amazing Alison, who's gonna be doing interpreting into British Sign Language for us. Um, Uma's going to take us through, there's going to be a bit where she puts the cauliflower in the oven and maybe talks on screen a bit more about health food connections and um, well-being and then go back, bring it all together. And then she and I are going to have a chat at the end. For those of you who are familiar with Zoom, um, you'll know about the chat box. For those of you who don't, if you go down to the bottom and um, you click on the chat box, if you have any questions, Chat, type, type them in there. I'll try and keep a bit of a running tally on um, what there is to ask. I've also got a load of questions to ask Uma about the book. And um, at that point, we can carry on. So, but really, without further ado, I am genuinely delighted to um, introduce somebody who's become a good friend over the last nine months, um, the marvelous Uma Naidu. Thank you so much, Mark. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm a bit of a soft talker, so I'm going to try my best. 
um, thank you for hosting me and inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, and welcome everyone. I hope by the end of this evening, you will either know how to make dinner for tomorrow or one of the other evenings, or you will cook along. Whenever I start a culinary class, I like to introduce myself. I'm a little bit of a hybrid. Um, I am a trained professional chef. Um, to the detour after going to medical school and residency at Harvard in uh, psychiatry. And I put this together with my background in nutrition education, and I say that to explain what I will talk about a little bit later on, which is that I work in nutritional psychiatry, which is what my book is on. And I offered to do this because, firstly, I think that Zoom makes these types of events possible. Secondly, I love to cook, and I love to share that with people. But also, I started cooking later in life. Um, I came from a very large Indian family, and there were always mothers, aunts, grandmothers, older cousins in the kitchen. And I know that- Uma, was... Uma, can I just interrupt a second? I'm just getting a couple of comments saying um, it's quite hard to hear. So unfortunately, would you be able to sort of shout a little bit? Because I know you're a bit away from your microphone. Give me one second to, I'll try to move this closer. Can you hear me now and still see? Yeah, we can see okay. And I think that sounds better as well. I'm just looking on the chat. Yeah, I'm getting a couple of comments of better already. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to speak up as well. Um, so, so in large part, my background is, is uh, different and I, it comes together for me with the nutrition and being a chef and a psychiatrist in nutritional psychiatry. So it's working with individuals on their mental well-being, using food and nutrients, using healthy whole foods. And you know, supplements once in a while are completely fine, but I hope to talk with you about the ingredients, why I chose them tonight. Um, and we'll, we'll touch base on that the moment we get something in the oven for dinner. So the first thing about starting to cook uh, and please forgive me, I'm sure many of you are, are well-seasoned cooks, but I always start off my classes this way because as chefs, it, you know, it's food safe, safety and safety in the kitchen first. So in terms of safety, always wash your hands before you start. If you have your children or family members helping you, always wash your hands, especially now. Um, secondly, um, I like to secure my chopping board. It's something I learned at the Culinary Institute uh, with I use a, uh, you can use a piece of paper towel. I use a cloth that I dampen slightly. And then this prevents my board from sliding when I cut something big. The second thing I wanted to share is that everything in cooking is so much easier if it's laid out. And we call that mise en place. Again, many of you may know about this already, but it's really setting up your ingredients so that when you're ready to cook, everything is ready to go. So I'm gonna ask you all to, see, whoever's cooking along, please set your oven, make sure there's nothing in your oven before you turn it on. Um, I'm reminded of that episode of Sex in the City where she stores her mail in the oven. So I'm just saying, let's check, check that there's nothing in the oven. Set your temperature uh, according to the recipe guide because I'm in the US and our temperature uh, is different. The, the, um, uh, measurement is different. So I have my oven on. I can actually hear it heating up. So let's do that. And then I want to mix together the marinade for the cauliflower steak. Now, it might be unusual to, to call a piece of cauliflower steak, but with a lot of people trying to be more plant-based or plant-rich in the United States, this has become a very popular food item. It's incredibly nutritious. It's a lovely side dish if you want to pair it with a different protein, such as a side of salmon or um, you know, a piece of chicken, whatever you like. But it also can be made with florets. So if you have a frozen bag of cauliflower florets in your freezer, you can use that as well. The thing about savory cooking, which is what we're doing tonight, is that it's really something you can fix if you should make an error. Say you put too much of salt, or a little bit too much of spice. You can always balance that out. With baking, it's much more scientific and involving exact measurements. It's hard to save a cake. That being said, let's mix our marinade together. And I think a good question at this point would be, well, why do we need to do that? Why don't we just brush it on the cauliflower? Well, the reason is that the oil, especially when it's heated, allows spices to bloom and actually you know, share their delicious aroma.
So when you're cooking and, and you throw some spices, or if you've seen on television, spices being thrown into the hot oil or warming oil, it's really what a process called blooming, which is really to bring out the flavor. So we're going to prepare our marinade and I have a dish here and I set it on my board. And I am using just a simple uh, teaspoon measure. I'm going to measure out some turmeric with a pinch of black pepper. An easy hack for this is that, and I'll tell you why we're doing it a little bit later on. Um, I always add a pinch of black pepper to my bottle of turmeric and I store my spices. I use a lot of spices and I love spices. So I usually have larger jars of them. I store them in glass, but I also grind some black pepper into my turmeric mix and keep it that way because I use pepper in all my food, but it's also important that it gets paired with turmeric. The next thing that I'm gonna do is add some salt and some paprika and you can, and I also have some garlic powder here. Now with this recipe, if any of these ingredients don't appeal to you, but say you have a recipe for tikka masala or you have a recipe for a Mexican dish that you like and you have those spices, this marinade is interchangeable because Think of the cauliflower like a, like a blank canvas with which you can make a delicious dish. So I'm going to go ahead and do this and I'm going to use avocado oil um, for my roasting. And the reason for that is uh, that it does well at high temperatures in the oven. And it's a safer oil in terms of how it breaks down. And um, I am going to and in my, you, you certainly can measure, I'm pretty used to this recipe, so forgive me for being a little clumsy with it, but I'm, I'm pretty used to it and I know the amount that I'm throwing, using um, from my bottle, but feel free to use your measuring spoons. I have a great set here that, you know, is simple to use. And as you're learning to cook, certainly when I started cooking, I measured everything because that way I learned my recipes. Um, so feel free to do that if you have a set and if you don't, feel free to use a teaspoon. Like I said, with savory cooking, you know, we, we can save the dish just by adjusting the spice if it's too spicy. If it's not spicy enough, it's quite easy to do. Here's my bowl with my spices. Now, for today, I'm actually only making one steak because right now I'm, I'm on my own at, at home at, and it's lunchtime. But you can make as many as you like. I'm using a little whisk, but you can easily use a spoon to do this. And I'm just blending these up together so that you can see there's a nice blended marinade in here. I'm gonna set this aside so that I can cut my cauliflower. Now, I made sure that my board is secured. I washed and dried my cauliflower ahead of time. I also <clears throat> peeled off the leaves at the bottom. So if you want to make pretty inexpensive cauliflower steaks, this is the way to do it. In our supermarkets here, they actually sell cauliflower steaks, but as with any vegetables that they're cut and prepared at the supermarket, they're much more expensive. So a really easy way is to wash your cauliflower, peel off the leaves at the bottom. There are also um, many different colors of cauliflowers. The different colors are great because they're rich in antioxidants and plant-based polyphenols which are great for your brain. So go right ahead and get a different color. I've seen orange uh, and as well as some other colors. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I, this is my knife, I've secured my board and I'm gonna just chop off the end. And I'm gonna put that aside. Now I have my oven ready and I also have a sheet pan set aside. Um, I have a large sheet pan, it's a half sheet pan, but if you have a small family or you're using a small oven, just get a baking dish or a sheet pan that's smaller. But a good tip for cleanup, which will make it so much easier for you, is if you use a piece of parchment paper on top, because that really prevents it from sticking and you don't have to worry about using too much oil and it's a great way to get it done. So now that my, I've um, cut the base of the cauliflower off, it's now steady on the board. Now what I'm going to do is cut through the center and I love cauliflowers, by the way, because they kind of look like the brain. And I think you all might have realized by now that I'm pretty fascinated with the brain. I'm going to put this piece aside, but really you could cut at least one more steak from here as well. And you could, you could cook four or five steaks from a single cauliflower for different members of your family. You'll also notice that some crumbly bits fell off. 
I'm going to save these and put them aside because I could use that for roasted vegetables. I could use that for soup. I could use that for a stew later in the week. And the little knobbly bits that fall off, just put them in a uh, BPA-free little plastic bag and freeze them if you want to. You can always reuse. You know, one of the things they teach us in culinary school is not to waste. So one of the things I really try to, to teach in my classes is all the little bits that don't look great, you know, we find ways to use them. Even in the restaurant industry, we really just don't waste anything if we don't have to. So here's my brain looking cauliflower. Sorry, I couldn't help that. And then I'm gonna cut a nice piece here down the center. And what I have is a mostly completed nice piece of cauliflower. Now, I could cut a bigger piece. I am gonna do that. And I'm gonna put more of these aside, which I'll put in a baggie later. <clears throat> Next, what I'm going to do is put aside my pieces of cauliflower and I am going to have these laid out on my board, but I'm also going to get my sheet pan, which is prepared. My oven has already beeped, so I know that it's at the right temperature. Like I said, I have an enormous half sheet pan here. You can use a much smaller one. And what I'm going to do is gently slide these on or lift them up. They're pretty sturdy. And you have, I have two pieces here. I'm probably only going to need to cook one. And I have my piece of parchment, which is great because it's not going to stick. Now I'm going to use just, I use this little silicone brush. And for a second, let me just tell you that the head comes off so you can wash this in the dishwasher. You can, um, you know, soak it and get it clean. It's a little bit better than the um, other types of bristles and brushes, because I think that this ends up being a little bit cleaner. Sometimes when I have the bristles in um, other types of brushes for basting, some of the little threads fall off into the food on occasion. And I'm always concerned I don't get them clean enough. So I prefer one of these. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to brush. Remember my salt, pepper, everything is in my marinade. I'm now going to brush these with this beautiful color. And if you've chosen different spices, that's completely fine. It really, I've done this a steak in an Italian way. I've done it in a very um, sort of uh, rich Indian spice uh, way. And I think that this recipe is really easy and it's a great way to get some good healthy vegetables into your diet. And since cauliflower is somewhat bland on its own, uh, it, it, it allows for us to uh, make it a little bit more interesting and exciting. I'm just gonna put this aside. And if your oven isn't ready, just wait until your oven is ready and pop them in. It's going to take about 15 to 20 minutes. Now, if you have a slower oven or doesn't heat up to the right temperature, just watch it. It doesn't take long for these to cook through. So I'm gonna pop mine in the oven. Remember to have your oven gloves ready for when you need to take it out. Great, so now before we go ahead with, um, with the next uh, section of creating our little pesto here, what I wanted to do is just tell you a little bit about why I chose the ingredients that I did. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that a thumbs up from people? Okay, great. So in nutrition and mental health, what's evolved is that there have been studies done for decades on different nutrients such as folate, methyl folate, you find those easily in leafy greens. So think rocket lettuce or your favorite green lettuce, the greener, the better. But over time, also things like omega-3 fatty acids were studied in depression and anxiety. In the United States over COVID, we know that mental health is, is mental health, people are struggling and that it's something we need to be paying attention to. A statistic in the United States from the CDC came out around June 
and showed us that about 11% of Americans were considering suicide during COVID, which to a practicing psychiatrist such as myself is a very scary number. So we know that people are suffering. We know that it's hard to be in quarantine, even if there are stages of reopening where you are at. Certainly, some cities in the United States have a little bit more freedom than others, but it's a difficult time for many people. We also know that prescriptions for depressants, um, antidepressants, and for anti-anxiety medications have gone up. We also, and we know this from statistics that have been published. We also know that one of our main medications to treat anxiety and depression called sertraline, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, was on shortage in June this year which meant and showed that there were much more prescriptions for this medication. And lastly, one study completed earlier this year by the American Psychiatric Association showed that people had many different concerns, but the biggest concern was the fear of uncertainty, which I think many of us will agree is continuing. So I know that any which way that we can improve our mental well-being with food being an easy way to do it, I personally feel we should be paying attention to. My book is really based on different diagnoses, but here's the thing, you don't have to meet criteria for an illness to actually be taking care of your mental well-being. Eating is something we all have to do. In fact, we do this several times a day. And if we can eat in a healthier way and stay away from the junk food and the highly processed foods and highly sugared foods, we know what they are. We, we tend to have a sense of what's healthier than not healthy. We can set up our gut microbiome and our brain for better emotional health. So if you really want to get through this pandemic and come out stronger and fortify your mental health, I, I just want to encourage you to consider eating Maybe if you've picked up some bad habits, everyone has over the pandemic. If you've picked up some habits that you want to let go of, maybe today is a chance to think, well, what can I reset? So the other important thing in relation to all of this to explain is that there's a lot of connection, a very large connection between the gut and the brain. And you might think these are organs that are far apart in the body. What is she talking about? Well, the gut and the brain come from the same cells in the embryo as we develop. And they divide up and they go to different parts of the body, number one. The second thing is that throughout our lives, they are connected by our 10th cranial nerve from the brain to the gut called the vagus nerve, which communicates back and forth multiple chemical messages that are related to how we eat, that are related to stress and several other things. And thirdly, um, the serotonin receptors, 90% or more of them are located in the gut. It's telling us that what we eat as it gets digested is going to come in association with those receptors. The last thing is, especially now, a very large component of our immunity is in our gut. So it's really important to eat for our better health and our better immunity more than ever right now. And all I would say um, in relation to this, I'm happy to answer questions, is all the ingredients that I chose today, either the spices such as turmeric with a pinch of black pepper, why? Because turmeric hits the high notes on several mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, and several others. In my book, I break them down into foods, to, foods and spices and nutrients to embrace and those to avoid. So turmeric, is something that's easy to, if you don't cook with it, add it to a soup or a smoothie or even a tea. Um, and always add a pinch of black pepper because the piperine in black pepper activates the curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, which is this bright yellow spice, often called curry spice, but it's one of the ingredients. And on its own, it's called turmeric. Why do I grind my black pepper into the turmeric? Because that interaction makes the turmeric much more, almost 2,000% more bioactive, bioavailable to your brain and your body. So if you're going to benefit from turmeric and from being an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory and so many other positives, why not just add the black pepper in and always use it? Even You won't even taste it in a smoothie, I promise you. 
Um, in terms of the other ingredients, why cauliflower? So with the gut-brain connection, our microbiome is made up of about 39 trillion microbes that live down there. And their job is really to help us, help our immunity and help us thrive. But when we eat, you know, the junk foods and processed foods and, and sugary treats, unfortunately, the bad microbes in the gut take over. And when they do, over a period of time, things like inflammation get set up in your gut. And the condition is called dysbiosis. And when inflammation gets set up, it also loops back to cause brain inflammation, otherwise called neuroinflammation. And that's really when symptoms start to act up for people with mental well-being issues. Or it might be a completely healthy person, as, I, as a patient of mine was that I treated last year, but she had a promotion at work, had, was doing very well, and her diet changed entirely over 18 months because she was working more and traveling in airports, eating poorer meals in terms of good nutrition, eating junk foods, processed foods, snacks, salty foods, um, highly sugared foods because she was busy. And she actually presented in my office with severe anxiety. But as I took a proper history, we realized that what she had was inflammation in her gut, which was leading to these symptoms. She'd never had mental health issues before. So that speaks to the importance of taking care of our microbiome. All the ingredients in our recipes today do that. Vegetables such as cauliflower are rich in sulfurophanes. These are ingredients which feed well and feed the gut bacteria. The, the issue about fiber is fiber is found in fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, legumes, and healthy whole grains. You can't get it from seafood or animal proteins. So having a cauliflower with a rich source of fiber is really good to take care of the bugs in your gut. Um, I wanted to make sure that people understood that when we eat these vegetables, even the leafy greens we're going to use for our pesto, these feed bacteria in a good way and help us thrive. Um, with that, I'm going to start making the pesto. I think that we, I know we have this in the oven. I hope someone's timing and, and knows that we have some minutes left. So in terms of the pesto, you can... Um, I, I use a Vitamix that just happens to be what I use. You can use a food processor. A, a blender would work, but just don't get it too smooth because it's meant to be a chunky sauce. And I always have a few extra tips. One of them is I always keep some water on the side, just fresh filtered, filtered water that's cold. And the reason I do that is I'm going to add a good amount of olive oil to the recipe. I don't need to add to the calories, even though it's a healthy oil, I don't need to add to the calories in that meal. I can thin the sauce down or the pesto if I need to with a little bit of water. So with that, let's get started. I have everything laid out here. I'm gonna start with my courgette, which we call zucchini. And I'm going to add in my basil. Basil, as you guys might say, I washed everything and rinsed them out ahead of time. Uh, so everything here is ready to go. Now, I wanted to show you this. I had some rocket lettuce in the fridge. And I've done this many times where with a, in a pesto, I might add some fresh spinach or baby spinach that I have, or some rocket lettuce, which we call arugula, or different types of greens that I might have. Sometimes I've thrown in leaves of kale. Um, and the reason I do that is these are great healthy nutrients and the variety of different bio nutrients in these different vegetables and greens feed back to the biodiversity of your gut, meaning you're feeding those bugs or those microbes really good food. So I just decided that I was going to throw in some rocket lettuce. You don't have to, but the next time that you don't have basil in your fridge, feel free to try some different greens. Kale, I've done it with spinach, I've done it with rocket lettuce, and uh, it works really well. Then I'm going to throw in macadamia nuts. These are unsalted. And again, this is why I measured everything out ahead of time. I'm gonna use a piece of garlic. Now, I have a piece of um, garlic in here which will get blended in, but I would say that if you don't like the sharp 
taste of garlic since this is not going to be cooked. You can always use an alternative of just pure garlic powder. And you can do that. Um, you just need to use slightly less because a dry spice is usually much stronger and more flavorful than the fresh herb. So you usually need to use much less of it. There's my Parmesan cheese, which I've grated. And here's an easy hack for, um, for uh, grating your Parmesan cheese. It's a really hard cheese, right? For those of you who buy the little slab of cheese, you can cut up the rind and you can store the rind as long as it's clean and use it in the next time you make a soup or a stew. It lends a delicious flavor and saltiness. And before you eat your soup or stew, just use a pair of tongs and take out the rind. You don't want to eat it, but you can let it infuse the flavor. It's a trick I learned in culinary school, and it really adds depth of flavor and delicious, deliciousness to your soup and stew. And, and remember, I said, you know, we try not to waste anything. Um, but an easy hack to getting it grated, is you can stand and, and grate all of it as much as you can, but you can also get the slab cut it up into just big chunks and put it in your food processor and just zap it a few times and it really ends up, really looks like it's grated. And that's a great way to use it if you need to sprinkle it on something or need to make this kind of a pesto. Um, the very last ingredient is the lemon zest. So I just squeeze a little bit of lemon in and then I have a handy zester here And I just do this because the zest is just a little bit, I do it directly into my, um, my Vitamix blender. I'm gonna add a little bit of water and I'm going to add my olive oil. I hope for those of you cooking, you've had a chance to measure these out. And if you haven't, we have time. This is a this is not a quick uh, this is not a, a a long recipe. And I'm just going to make a big noise blending this up. Great. So my pesto is ready. Um, my, I believe that my steak is almost ready. But I am happy to, before we plate everything, I'm happy to answer some questions and see uh, if anyone wants to ask anything. Hi, Uma. I'm, what I'm trying to do is moderate some of the questions that have been coming through. Um, and uh, brilliant, by the way, I love the fact that you translate American food names into British as well. Um, I, when I lived in the States, I spent years trying to find coriander only to find out Americans call it cilantro. Yes. Um, and that's, that's kind of classic. So your zucchini courgette thing, yes. Apart from upsetting Alison, having to do two words for the same thing is a really good for us to be able to understand that. So thank you. One quick question um, was uh, avocado oil. That's not very common here compared with lots of the other oils we get. Explain why avocado um, oil is good um, and what, what, what is a good alternative if you can't get it easily? It, it's got to do, Mark, with the temperature at which we're roasting this at a higher temperature, and it's how the oils break up at those temperatures. It's not the worst thing, but it's just a healthier option. If you can't get avocado oil, um, olive oil is fine. Just cook at a slightly low temperature for longer, and that oh. way it cooks slowly and gently and doesn't heat up um, too much. Okay, that's good. That's interesting. Had a couple of questions. Uh, some people are putting in the Q&A, some in the chat. Um, actually, there's one question around allergies. 
Um, does, um, if you have a nut allergy um, or a cheese allergy, are there good substitutes for either, well, firstly nuts and then also cheese? Sure, so with, um, let's start with uh, the cheese. I think that if you're vegan or um, you know, perhaps you don't eat cheese or you have a problem with cheese, nutritional yeast is a, is a powdered product that you can add, which vegan, um, vegan recipes call for to give that cheesy flavor to say mac and cheese and other things. So it's called nutritional yeast, that's what we call it here. It's easy to get in our supermarkets and you can put in about a tablespoon to a recipe, mix it up, taste it. If it has enough of a cheesy flavor, that's a good one. With nuts, that's a little bit harder. What I would do, if you can't consume nuts, any type of nut, um, then maybe make the pesto really with different greens. And um, you, know, you can use some rice cauliflower and that for thickness. And you can flavor it up with cheese and other ingredients um, such as the garlic powder and lemon juice to make it yummy and tasty even though you're missing the nuts. Um, I would probably in that recipe not eat, add any water because it will probably be thinner. The nuts are what kind of thicken it and give it that body. Um, so I wouldn't add that and I might add less olive oil to your mixture. So what I would do is halve the amount of olive oil try it out and just add a little bit more olive oil in your blender if you need to. You know, there, there isn't an equivalent, um, if someone's allergic to nuts, it's different to put something else in a pesto. But I think adding in something like a piece of cauliflower, which will make it thicker um, and just making it loaded with greens and flavor could be a good way to go. Great. Um, I've got a couple of comments here. Um, and you've, Engivita brand for nutritional yeast in the UK sounds great. Um, I have a question from Pauline from um, uh, Edinburgh. Um, how long would, can you keep spare pesto in the fridge? Um, because she's worried that does the nutritional value diminish as you leave it in? That's a great question. So when I make up a batch of pesto like this, I store it in a glass jar with a tight lid and I you know, don't use the same spoon or taste it and put the spoon back for obvious reasons, but store it in here for about three to five days. Um, you can always look at it. If it looks good and tastes good, it should be fine, but I wouldn't go probably because of the cheese, uh, probably beyond about five days up to a week maximum, but as long as it's in a clean glass jar and stored in your fridge. Great. A couple of comments. Pine nuts of... Are... You can freeze it. You Sorry, can, you can freeze the pesto. Oh, you can freeze the pesto as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, question about in pestos, often people use pine nuts. Is there any reason macadamia nuts are better? Are they more nutritional? Or yes, they are a little bit more nutritious. Nothing wrong with pine nuts in moderation in a pesto. Great choice if that's your go-to nut. Um, you know, when when I wrote my book, I went into the research behind the levels of omega-3 and omega-6 fats in different uh, plant-based sources. So for example, I have a piece of salmon I'm gonna show you in a second to show you that this recipe is interchangeable and they are rich um, uh, uh, fat, fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, anchovies and some others are very rich in omega-3 fats which are very good for anxiety as well as depression. Um, but you want to always maintain more omega-3 than omega-6 fats. That's the same thing with unhealthy oils, like certain vegetables or highly processed oils can change that ratio, which is pro-inflammatory, leading to more likely that you can develop some inflammation in the body um, because of that. Macadamia nuts just have a really good amount of omega-3s and they have a very low of the omega-6s. So it's just a healthier option in that way. My other choice is hazelnuts. I know these can be more costly. They are here, but just use less of them. Um, you don't need a ton of it, just a taste of it. And you can make up the rest of that flavor with your garlic powder, your spices, your lemon juice, and your greens. Uh, so that, that was the reason I chose, I chose that. Great. And there's one question as well. Um, one, one participant has um, a child who really doesn't like vegetables. Um, and how do you 
kind of eat healthily moving I mean, this is a sort of bigger question but if, if vegetables really aren't an option how do you ensure that either you or your child can get the, the right levels of nutrients etc so you know what i would do uh, what what i tend to advise in terms of children who won't eat it is think about a healthy a healthy way that you can disguise it into a food that they will eat um, there are recipes on the internet internet for cauliflower crust for pizzas um, there are recipes for um, how can you make a, uh, a veggie burger from ground vegetables that looks like a burger and you can still add in some meat with that. It's, it's you know, if the, if the child eats all, to, all types of food, I would say make that with some ground turkey or ground uh, chicken, flavor it up, but put in some ground cauliflower. There's, uh, uh, you know, we have riced cauliflower here and it's very easy to put piece of cauliflower in your food process and make, make it riced, um, or you can buy it frozen. What I would do is make something like patties or things that he or she might like, but load it in with veggies as well as the meat that he or she wants to eat, and then just flavor it up so that it looks like a burger, but it has veggies in it. I would also do things like a smoothie. You can add spinach to a smoothie. You can add uh, berries like blueberries uh, to a smoothie, super nutritious. And you could put in, say, an almond milk or a different kind of, or dairy milk, if, if it's grass-fed, I prefer, um, and, and have it that way. So if your child likes a smoothie, that's another way to, you know, kind of sneak in the vegetables. And they're not going to taste it because they're going to taste the berries. Um, and that's another way to do it. So I try to create um, disguises for the food and get the veggies in. I think it's, it's, it's not the healthiest, I, you know, I can't honestly recommend, sure, let's skip the vegetables entirely because they're so important just for balanced nutrition. So it's how can we get it in? Otherwise, can you make a chili, which has um, a, a chili soup or a bean stew or a meat stew and add in veggies that maybe they don't see, um, you know, things like lentils and uh, beans and other, other tiny pieces of vegetables that they don't see or don't care about. Or you can make the soup and puree it into a thicker stew and serve it with, you know, some nice crunchy nuts on top or something that, that your child likes so that they don't realize that, it's, uh, that it has vegetables in it. Brilliant. Uma, I think you said that I'm in charge of making sure you don't burn the um, cauliflower. Do you want to just have a quick check? Okay. So um. Remember to use your oven mitt. Take this out. So mine are, uh, mine are cooked. Excellent. Lovely. And um, just because I don't want to, I had one prepared a hand mark because I didn't want to burn my fingers here um, and work with it. So this was the one I did earlier from a different cauliflower. It roasted up a little bit more. It probably was a little heavier on the spice on that one. And you know, later on, I'll put my pesto into a glass jar. But look, it's as simple as this. I'm just going to use my spoon. If I can find it, here it is. And, you know, nothing super fancy about this. I'm going to just sprinkle it on to my piece of cauliflower as much as you like, because this is a really great and healthy pesto. And that's just the, the piece of cauliflower, but I'm going to show you how I plated it. So if you were going vegetarian tonight, I was going to say um, I made a cauliflower steak here. I put in some fresh baby tomatoes. I made a spinach salad with some sweet peppers, a squeeze of lemon juice. I didn't need to make a dressing. And I happen to have a, a tahini paste or some hummus at home. And I used it on this piece of cauliflower. So that's a variation of this recipe. If you don't wish to make the pesto, but say you cooked up six steaks tonight, six cauliflower steaks tomorrow, you can put on some pomegranate seeds. I put a little bit of the tahini paste that I made and it's a different topping. And I had a salad together with it so that it was a filling and nutritious meal. Now, You'll also notice that I use a lot of colors in terms of the vegetables that I choose. The tomatoes are rich in lycopene. Lycopene is a super important antioxidant. 
there's actually more lycopene in the skin of tomatoes than it is in the flesh. So try to cook your tomatoes with the skin on if you can. And you know the, the sweet peppers are uh, rich in, in antioxidants as well. And of course, we talked about spinach. The last thing I will say just about the recipe is I just baked up a piece of salmon earlier today. It's about a six, about a four inch piece of salmon. And I wanted to show you that if you have or get pieces of salmon that way from your supermarket, you can bake them up. They just take a less, less time than a piece of cauliflower. And at the same temperature, they take about eight minutes or so. And of course you want to make sure that it's cooked through unless you like it undercooked, which is usually safe, as long as you buy it from a good, you know, a good quality salmon, because, you know, sushi is not cooked. So people consume um, undercooked salmon all the time. So that's an easy recipe. And I chopped it with the pesto here as well. And I would probably serve it with the salad, um, like I did the piece of cauliflower. So that's another option for you as well. That's marvellous. I'm getting so many questions. I've got the Q&A box and the, the chat box open at the same time. But I just want to take a step back about a couple of not just cooking questions, but actually the, the mental well-being questions that we're getting. Um, it's a couple of people talking about um, anxiety specifically. Are there specific foods that are good about relieving anxiety? Yes. So I, I like to talk um, about things to avoid first so that you know the things that worsen anxiety. Added sugars worsen anxiety. Studies have actually shown this. Processed vegetable oils and things like fast foods and certain restaurant foods worsen anxiety. And artificial sweeteners worsen anxiety as well. Um, trans fats and foods have been associated with increased aggression. So those are things to stay away from. In terms of things to eat, salmon, excellent choice because it's rich in omega-3s. If you don't eat fish, there are plant-based sources of omega-3s, and those can be chia seeds, flax seeds, sea vegetables, algae, um, and other types of nuts and seeds, which are good in a different kind of omega-3. Um, and, you know, you, so say you don't eat fish. By the way, turmeric with that pinch of black pepper a quarter teaspoon a day with a pinch of black pepper, hits the high notes on studies of anxiety. So that's worth adding in. The, the, the third thing I would say is um, start to, um, you know, uh, start to eat things uh, that have, are rich in pre and probiotic foods, which are really good for your gut. And these are things like um, highly fibered vegetables, the allium family, onions, leeks, garlic, asparagus, several others that feed the good bacteria, add some fermented foods like kefir um, and kimchi and miso, fermented foods also help your gut. So I would start there with a few things like that. Brilliant. Can I just ask from a personal point of view, I know you and I have talked about um, fermented foods and so kombucha, um, kombucha I here so all of them are the only thing i would say about those mark is with all of them just worry about the added sugar because there are lots of great kombucha juices in the market um th that you get supermarket that you can buy but always check the, the sugar content um four grams of sugar is one teaspoon and so if you quickly calculate that um you know you just don't want to be taking in a ton of sugar because that kind of makes it more like a like a cool drink or a soda that's brilliant. In fact, I, I, my, my only thing where everybody's talking about making a sourdough bread in Britain during lockdown, it became almost like a, a kind of cliche. Um, and a couple of my friends and I decided to start grow, um, brewing our own kombucha. So we're quite proud of ourselves on that. Um, talking of which, my friend Jill from Sheffield has um, asked, are there any, who is also a fellow kombucha brewer, um, are there any, um, foods that make you help you sleep better? Yes, so I like to talk about um, the long list in my book, but, but my quick and easy um, when I'm giving lectures is to flip your dinner, uh, flip your breakfast to dinner. What I mean by that is I try to encourage, well, you know, sleep is, is a, there are several things related to sleep as with nutrition. It's, it's very much a holistic approach. And I should also say, Mark, it's not the cure-all. If someone's actively suicidal or has lost touch with reality, 
or is actively manic, given this is a uh, mental wellness week, um, I, I want people to know that you still sh you should be calling your GP, your doctor, going to the hospital, the emergency room, because you might need more treatment. It doesn't exclude using food, but you might need more acute treatment before you also integrate um, food methods. Um, that being said, I think that, um, can you repeat the question, Mark? It was about sleep. Is there anything in particular that help you sleep better? Thank you. So I like to uh, flip, uh, flip breakfast for dinner. Um, and I'm saying that sleep hygiene is really important. So everything related to sleep is an important discussion, but food, eat melatonin rich foods, eggs, um, good source of dairy, asparagus, broccoli, and a few others. And what I like to do is make those into an omelet and have people have that at dinner time as they're starting to get ready for, for bed. So have that for dinner instead of make a frittata or an omelet with those kinds of vegetables in them and start preparing for bed and instead of instead of having it for your breakfast. It's it's a it's a good trick that I like to suggest. Great. And we've got Paul from the South Coast. God, this is we're so international and national, Uma. It's it's fabulous. Um uh Paul's vegan and would like to kind of keep as close to vegan as he can, but um wondered whether there are he's worried about getting ensuring he gets enough proteins. Sure. I think that if you're eating, um, you know, eating lentils, beans, um, nuts, seeds, um, if you are able to eat healthy whole grains um, and eating, you know, a, a rich array of vegetables, I think that should be fine. I would check on your vitamin B12 because that's usually obtained from meat. Um, and I would check that you're not low on that level. You might need to be supplemented. You can speak to your GP or your doctor about that. Um, but that's the, uh, you know, you, but there are ways that you can, um, you can get good sources of protein through plant-based, plant-rich and plant-based sources as well. Okay, that's great. Um, and then, uh, right, sorry, I'm just trying to check. Is, is, in terms of the, the bad things for you, alcohol, chocolate, um, you know, not every, everybody aspires to good, but we also, everybody has weaknesses. What, those two things seem to be quite common in a lot of people. Is I, I personally have a huge sweet tooth around chocolate. Other people will like their glass of wine. With any advice for, for those kind of sin foods, as they're called often? Sure. You know, um... The, 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 let me go through alcohol first. I like to pe offer people a few tips. Um, if, if you're in trouble um, and you've gotten, it's gotten out of hand over the pandemic, then you need to speak to your doctor or your therapist uh, because it has for many people in the US, uh, we know that alcohol consumption has increased. But if you're you know, enjoying a glass of wine, go ahead and do that. Maybe switch it out with a glass of sparkling water in between. If you're having cocktails, I usually say, Try not to go for the mixed drinks. They have simple syrup, which is basically sugar in them. They have added liquors, which is more calories and more alcohol. Maybe go for a purer cocktail with a fresh squeeze of lemon or lime uh, in an actual, um, ju you know, squeezed into the fruit versus a store-bought orange juice. Um, and also a splash of um, sparkling water or soda water, which is, there's no calories in that versus tonic water, which can be sweetened. Um, so you might want to try those tricks. Also know that with alcohol, it can worsen anxiety. You may feel calm in the moment, but it worsens anxiety and it worsens depression. So if it's become a little bit more of an indulgence over the pandemic, maybe think about how ways that you can cut back a little bit and do it slowly. Um, in terms of chocolate, it all depends on the type of chocolate, extra dark, raw, uh, chocolate that is the more natural chocolate actually is good for us. It's good for the brain and it may, it may have caffeine. So it might help, might, you might have some difficulty sleeping if you're sensitive to caffeine, but a, a piece of extra dark chocolate is not the worst thing. It's actually good for your brain. It's super rich in cacao flavonols, which are good for the brain, but unfortunately it's not the candy bars and the milk chocolate and the, and the uh, other types of chocolate that we are more used to seeing at the supermarket. Um, so we're talking uh, extra dark chocolate and a more natural form. So it's, in that way, it's pretty healthy. 
What, just in terms of the chocolate, are you talking 70, 80 percent, that, yeah, that level? Shapes and dark, the more natural raw forms, usually they're in a chunk or some of the uh, newer companies have different chocolate bars that are out, but you can read the ingredients. And you, you know, what you want to watch for is that it's really not processed, that it's more natural. And sometimes the dark chunks, you know, you can use the serrated knife, cut up a piece, have that with, you know, blueberries or a piece of small clementine or a uh, little orange or something like that. That's a great flavor profile that goes together as a dessert instead of say a candy bar. So those are, those are just some, some tricks. Also cacao nibs are super nutritious um, and get the unsugared ones. Cacao nibs are little crunchy bits made in that process. And you can chop like, you know, you can chop berries with you, berry you can put on your oatmeal. It's, it's, a, great, it's a, great, uh, a great trick to use to get the crunch fact in something good just get the unsweetened kind. Brilliant, Uma. We are nearly at the top of the hour. And I know, hopefully I've managed to cap mo catch most of the questions. Um, just for those of you who asked, yes, we are recording this. And with Uma's permission, we'll allow it to be circulated to people afterwards so they can catch the various gems of wisdom that um, Uma's talk, not only about cooking, but actually also about the, the good foods that are good for things. I cannot recommend, this is my plug on behalf of Uma. This book is now available in the United Kingdom um, from Amazon and all good bookshops. Um, Sam has just um, shared with everybody the, the link on Amazon. Um, it's great. I have to say that because obviously I, I adore Uber, but actually it's it's fascinating because I collect cookbooks, so it's great because it's got tons of recipes in. But I have to say that um, it's just got really good stuff. It's it's done not in a overly technical way. It actually tells you really clearly why certain things work for your brain, why your gut. It's very important to keep that in good shape, and I just think that. Um, it's a must have book actually, to be honest, both for your physical well being as well as your mental well being. And as Uma will say, they're both massively interrelated. So I'm getting a lot of comments from people who've been on the session, and um, people are really enjoying this. They've got a lot out of it. I'm getting comments about how good the pesto is from a couple of people who've made comments of saying they're obviously now enjoying their dinner. Um, Uma, I want to say thank you so much. Thank you for the amount of effort that you've done um, in preparing. Um, I do laugh. There's a, a television show of, for all of us in Britain that um, was very famous when we were kids called um, Blue Peter. And they would always do um, examples of um, things, but then they'd always be a bit of a disaster. And then they bring out one that they'd done earlier and it was always perfect. And you know that the stagehands had done it. You've managed to do both preparing it very well beforehand and doing it live, which is perfect. Thanks. So I'd like to thank you hugely for that. Um, I would also like to thank my wonderful colleague, Alison, who has been translating American food into British food, has been keeping up with everything. And I just want to say um, this was quite a, an exciting session, but also quite a nerve wracking session because the, the amount of things that could have gone wrong in terms of technical devices, distances and everything. So I hope people have enjoyed it. I would love to say, Uma, next year when you've done the follow up book, we'll, we'll definitely have you back on this. And um, it's thank been magic. You. Thank you. May I interrupt with just two things? Of course. Okay. Um, if anyone is in the US, this is the same book in the US. It's called This Is Your Brain on Food. You said you had an international audience, so I thought I would let people know. Um, but the other thing is, please follow us on social media because we put out information all the time. Um, and it's you know usually recent studies, updated research, and recipes sometimes. So that's at D R U M A. N-A-I-D-O-O. -O. We'd love to see you on social media as well. And then finally, what we'd love to do is, my colleagues, is if you have pictures of your recipe that you've had tonight, um, hashtag mental wealth 2020. I think it should have been in your, um, your kit that you got sent beforehand. So um, show us what you've done. Show us the fabulous things that we've created all around the country and beyond. Um, 
anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I, I really appreciate Uma taking the time to do this with us. Um, we just put the hashtag out there, um, show us your food. Um, the other bit is for the next five days, we've got some amazing events that are going on. We've got um, Ruby Wax's Frazzle Cafes. We've got Dr. Norena Hertz tomorrow night on The Lonely Century and her new book. Um, so we've just got some really, really good things. So if you want to go to the City Lit website, look on the Mental Wealth Festival um, subsite, then you'll see what else there is. Um, this is the only food extravaganza, but um, hopefully it's um, set you uh, an idea of the types of things we do. Again, everybody eat well. If those of you have been adventurous to cook while you've been going on, and for those of you who are going to do it later, um, enjoy your evening, enjoy your dinner. Uma, lots of love. Thank you very much and um, take care of yourself. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night.